Hello, everybody. We're going to go over a bit of verb review today. You can watch this video as many times as you need to, as many times as you want. Remember that you can pause if you are working on a little bit of practice or if you want to test yourself. Otherwise, return to this whenever you need to. We're going to start with a basic definition. What is a verb? Essentially, it's an action word. So we're talking about words like run, sing, or fly, but also some things you might not typically think of as actions exactly, like think, feel, or wonder. But anything that can be the action in a sentence can be your verb. So if it fits that definition, it is a verb. It can also be a word of being. And that sounds a little bit weird, but basically we're talking about one word in particular, which is the word is. It has lots of different forms, and in English it's very irregular. So is, am, are, was, were, and be, all those are forms of the same word. They all mean the same thing if you think about it. They're just different tenses. So that's all the same word, and we call that the verb of being. You don't have to remember that. You can just think of that as a regular old verb, but it tends to be a little bit different from the others because it's used so often. And that's exactly why it's so irregular. It's gotten used to bits. So that in Latin is going to be the verb sum, and we can still call it the verb of being if you want, just so that we're clear on what's what. So in a, an example sentence here, I saw a great movie yesterday. The verb would be saw, the verb of action there. That's not necessarily a get up and run around kind of action, but it's the closest thing to an action we have in that sentence. Keep in mind that to be a sentence, we must have a verb. No sentence will exist without some kind of verb. It's the only thing that you absolutely have to have in a sentence. So there will be a verb. In this sentence, there are actually two verbs. That can happen if I have two clauses. We'll be talking more about clauses in Latin too, but it's basically a way of making a more complicated sentence. We actually call them complex when we have two multiple clauses. Um, so this one has two clauses, and I can tell that because it has two verbs. It has the verb we're hoping, which is plural and imperfect, if you remember your terms. If not, we'll go over those in a little bit. But it also has a second verb over here, would come, is also a verb. So I know that in this sentence I have two clauses because I have two verbs. If I have two clauses, I must have two verbs. If I have two verbs, I don't necessarily have to have two clauses. I could say something like, my brother and I were wishing and hoping. And in that case, that's still one clause because the subject is the same with those verbs. But if I have a connecting word like that, it's usually a separate clause. Again, we'll talk more about clauses later this year in Latin too, but Keep in mind that sentences can have more than one verb. When we're talking about verbs, we tend to talk a lot about their properties, especially in Latin, because we use those endings on verbs to determine what's what with verbs. We gotta know what's going on. The first property that we talk about is person. Person is essentially the perspective of the speaker. We call it first person, second person, third person. Really what that means is, am I talking about myself doing an action, which would be first person? Am I talking about you, the person I'm talking to, doing an action, that second person? Or am I talking about someone else? That would be third person. Third person is really a very big catch-all. It's anyone that doesn't include me and you. So if I'm talking about the entire world, as long as I'm not including myself in that, it's third person. That also works for objects and animals. If a stone is sitting on a bank, that stone is third person, even though it's not a person at all. So think less as actual people and more as perspective. That's why it starts with purse. So our perspective. Another property is number. This is maybe the easiest to remember, but be careful not to get it mixed up with person, since the uh, options for person are actually one, two, and three. We think of that as number sometimes. That's not what we mean. When we use number, we're talking about how many people are doing the action. The people doing the action, remember, are called the subject. So how many are the subject? Are we talking about one person or thing? Or are we talking about 
multiple people or things. Anything more than one is plural. If it's just one, it's singular. So if I'm doing something that's first person, but it's also singular. If we are doing something that's still first person, but it's now plural because I'm talking about more than one person. Tense is a big property that we talk about a lot because it has a lot of different options. This is the one with the most options, in fact. When you're trying to figure out the tense, we have six different tenses in Latin. This tells us when the action takes place. So you can think of tense just as the, an essentially synonym for time. When does the action happen? Our options include present, imperfect, future, perfect, pluperfect, and future perfect. And this is typically how we divide up our verbs when we're looking at the Latin forms, if we're looking at a chart or a paradigm, so that we can see the differences between them. Because this is typically what makes the biggest difference between forms of a verb. A fourth property is voice. Voice is whether or not the sentence is inverted. That sounds a little strange, but we're talking about whether lightning strikes the tree or the tree is struck by lightning. Those two sentences convey the same thought, but we can invert the sentence to the tree was struck by lightning, and that makes the tree the subject, which in the uninverted sentence is actually the object. So we're talking about whether the subject is doing the action or being acted upon. We call this active or passive. So you can think of aggression. People love to talk about someone being passive aggressive. If I am actively aggressive, I am punching you in the face. But if I am passively aggressive, I'm not actually doing anything. I'm just aggravated. So it's more like something's happening to me because I'm just sitting there being angry. So that's what we mean by active and passive, whether the subject is acting or being acted upon. Mood is a property that we haven't talked about as much in Latin 1. This is more of a Latin 2 topic, so we'll be talking a lot about mood this year. This is the reality of an action. If we're talking about an indicative word, which is most of what we've learned so far, then we're talking about something that actually happened or actually is happening or is going to happen. It doesn't matter when, but it's a real action that we, we for all intents and purposes, assume is going to happen or is happening. If I'm talking about an imperative verb, that's a different mood entirely. That means I'm giving a command. If I give a command, there's no guarantee that that action is happening or is going to happen at all. I'm just telling you to do something. And we all know that when people tell us to do things, often they don't really happen. So that's not an indicative verb. Subjunctive is a fun mood. This is the one we'll spend a lot of time on in Latin too. Subjunctive means that the action isn't real. And that sounds a little weird, but we actually talk about things that aren't real quite frequently. This is any time we're using complex sentences with multiple clauses. They can happen a lot there. So if I say something like, I wish I were a dragon, I don't by the way, but if I wish I were a dragon, then wishing is actually happening. That's an indicative verb. But were being a dragon, that's not actually happening. So that's a subjunctive verb. So anytime we're talking about wishes, that's a really good example of what the subjunctive will sound like. And it's actually the only time that we really use it correctly in English. And a lot of people still don't. They'll say, I wish I was. But if you say, uh, I wish I were, that's the subjunctive form in English. And that's why it sounds a little funky like that. It's because we're using a different mood. In Latin, it's going to be more obvious that the word is subjunctive. And it's also going to be more common for us to use it. We're going to have a lot of uses. So just for some examples, we have seen would be an indicative verb. We actually saw something. Help is an imperative verb. I'm commanding or asking for something to happen, but it might not. And if only I were, it's pretty clear that that's not real action. It's subjunctive. Paradigms. This is a word that means um, basically we're just putting a verb into a chart. We can make noun paradigms as well, and we will later. Or you might have already watched the noun video, but there is another for nouns. 
Paradigms are going to be a very useful way for us to practice, as you should know from Latin 1, because this allows us to see all our forms together and sort of compare endings and compare middles of verbs so that we can see how they change in different forms. This is our typical six box chart. Remember that the left side is singular, the right side is plural, and the three rows represent the first, second, and third person. So this will always be I for the first box, you for the second box, and he, she, or it for the third. And then on the right side we have we, y'all, and they. So the pronouns that we'll use will never change because we're using that little box to represent those pronouns essentially. This box, or paradigm, represents the present tense, and I'm using the verb amo. You might remember that amo is a first conjugation verb, which means it's very regular and easy to conjugate. So that's why I'm using it as our example here. So we just want to review how this works. Notice that I have changed the endings in every form. The endings ost, mus, tis, and t represent certain pronouns, meaning I, you, he, she, it, we, all, and they. Um, we learned a little song for this, if you might remember. I'm not going to sing it now, but feel free. To change tense, I would need a whole nother box, because I'm going to change a significant portion of the word. I'm adding a syllable, in this case, to make the verb future. So I've changed from present to future here. To make a future verb, I add bo, be, boo, which in effect comes out as bo, be, 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 boo. I use the be a lot of times. But then the endings stay the same. That's very convenient for us. We don't have to learn new endings to represent people. We just have to remember to add that little bo, be, boo sim, um, syllable in the middle to make it future. There's also the imperfect tense the third tense we learned, which has ba in the middle. And this one's even easier because it's just the same all the way through. Notice again that our endings don't change with the exception of that m on the first person singular. That is an option. We can use o or m, and we'll use o for the present and the future, but m for the imperfect. Sum is another example of a place where we would use m for the first person singular ending. Now these three tenses are known as the present system because we form them all from the present stem. If you don't remember how to do that, you take your principal parts, you go to the second principal part, cut off the RE, and that portion that's left is called our present stem. And that will work for any verb except irregular verbs. And irregular verbs mean that we always have to learn them separately, so we'll see sum in a second, which is irregular. But for any other verb, any regular verb, we go to our second principal part, cut off the RE and use that AMA, or whatever is left, as our present stem. Now the one exception is the very first form in the present tense. You see that it doesn't have an A, and that's because I just used the first principal part. The first principal part is the first person singular verb, always. So I can just plug that right in and I don't even have to think about it. So remember these three ver uh, verb tenses are the present, imperfect, and future, and they are called the present system because they use the present stem. Now I can also make these verbs passive. Remember passive means we're inverting the sentence order, so instead of I loved, I am loved. This means we changed the ending, so we'll use instead of O-S-T, M-U-S-T, I-S-N-T, we will use er, ris, ter, mer, mini, enter. That one's a little bit harder to spell right because we're learning it as syllables, but practice a few times and you'll get it back down. Er, ris, ter, mer, mini, enter. To make it future, we do exactly the same thing. We add our bo, be, boo syllable. Notice there's one small change here. We have bo, baby, boo, because apparently Romans found it really difficult to pronounce B, I, R. We very rarely see that syllable, so something about it was hard to pronounce, and so it became an, an E over time. It's not a big deal if you forget that one, but in the passive we will see an E there. Still future tense. So we've got our bow baby boo, and then our future or our passive endings again. So the passive endings stay the same as long as we're in the passive. Er, is ter, mer, mini, enter.
And then in the imperfect, exactly the same thing, but I use my ba syllable to say that I'm in the imperfect. Now, there are three other tenses. We have the perfect tense, the pluperfect tense, and the future perfect tense. And notice that all of those in their names have in common the word perfect because they're all in the perfect system, because they're all formed from the perfect stem. We do have to remember that the imperfect is not one of these. It's the only one. So that one belongs in the present tense and it just has an unfortunate name. Just think that M means not, so it's not perfect, it's the imperfect. So the perfect pluperfect and future perfect form our perfect system. The perfect stem comes instead of the second part from the third principle part. So we'll see it coming from there. Often it has a V, but not always, so don't assume the V. It depends on what the principal part is. This is why you have to know your principal parts. So sorry. So we'll take that out. Usually means we're cutting off the I at the end. So we'll just add it back on for the first person singular in the perfect tense there. So you can think of the third principal part also as your uh, simple past but we'll have to manipulate it for any other forms, and so we'll cut off the I for our manipulation. Um, the perfect tense is the only tense that has specific endings that can't be used anywhere else. So, e is the it, imis is this erunt, is unique to the perfect tense. If you see those endings, that's what you're looking at, unless it has to be happens to be a word that has a, maybe a present tense that's the same spelling, but that's not very common. So if you see e is the it, and is is this errant, think perfect tense, the simple past. The amawaram amawaras tense, that's the pluperfect, is using the imperfect of sum, which we'll review in a second. It goes around arasarat, around arasarat, arasarat. We're just attaching that to the perfect stem to make the pluperfect. The blue perfect is the super past, as in I had done something before I did anything else. And then the future perfect over on the right, we use the same stem, but use the future endings of, or the future forms of sum as our ending. So amawaro, amawaris, amawarit. That is the least common form right there, because that would translate to I will have loved. And we use that, but just not very much. So. This one's the lowest priority in your memorization scheme, but we want to know them all. Because you never want to be in a position where you run into something and you have no idea what it is. You want to be able to figure it out. And the more you have memorized, the easier and faster that will be. The passive for the perfect tense is actually quite easy, because what we're going to do is have two word forms, so make sure you leave that space in the middle, and they all sort of do the same thing. So we use the fourth principal part of whatever verb plus forms of sum. So the fourth principal part over here. And we use the entire thing. We don't have to do anything to it. The one possibility is that we might change the gender as if it were an adjective. So if I were talking about myself, I would say amata sum if I wanted to say that I was loved because I'm female, so I would use that A ending instead. But that's the only reason we would change those ending. In each conjugation here, you can see that the plural, the right side, switches to a plural ending for both words. So we have sum becoming sumus, but we also have a matus becoming a mati. That should be familiar from nouns and adjectives. So these are noun and adjective endings that we're using here. And we'll learn pretty soon why that is, because uh, these are participles and participles are one of the first things we'll do this year. So if you're curious about that, you will find out soon. But we're using adjective endings. So remember to switch the endings of both words when you make them plural. Otherwise, however, you just have to have the forms of sum memorized. So you'll use the present of sum for the perfect tense, you'll use the imperfect of sum for the pluperfect tense, and the future of sum for the future perfect tense, which lines up pretty nicely. Now, if you're thinking, hmm, I don't remember all these forms of sum, let's do a quick review of those. For the present tense, we have sum s s sumus s s sunt. This is the very first thing you learn, and you should know it like the back of your hand. If you don't, really stop and take time to do this. These come up all the time. 
I would actually say the same for the future and the imperfect. These are also very, very common. Uh, the future is a row, a ris, a rit, a rimus, a ritus, a runt. So you can hear that um, stereotypical vowel for the future tense popping up in there where it goes bobi boo and other verbs. Here it just goes o e u, but it's still there. And in the imperfect, where we would have had ba in a regular verb, we just have the ah here. But the vowel sounds are giving you a clue about the tense. The present is actually the one that looks the least like anything. It doesn't have a lot of clues for you about what it is, but fortunately it's very short, so just memorize it really, really well. These are your principal parts for some. Notice that we can't use the principal parts to conjugate. We're only going to use them for what they are in actuality. So sum is the first form. We do use that one. And an essay is only going to be used as an infinitive. So that means to be, and I'm not going to take it apart and try to use it to make anything else. It just is essay. That's it. We'll see fui over here. So there's our third principal part popping up again. And notice that in the perfect system, sum is completely regular. Now this is one of the reasons that we divide the tenses up into two systems, because every verb is regular in the perfect system. So for these three tenses, I will always follow the same rule, where I use the perfect stem, go to the third principal part, cut off the I, and use what's left. That's always what I will do, no matter what verb. So even sum, which is completely irregular all the time, here it's not. So anything in the perfect system is regular. So that gives us fui fuisti fuit, limis fuistis fuerunt. Regular, regular, regular. We won't see this quite as much as aram, and the reason is because the imperfect tense shows action over time, whereas the perfect tense shows a single momentary action something that happened at once. And if we're saying the word was or were, typically we mean that something was going on for a while, like when I was six. I was six for a whole year. So that's going to be the imperfect tense. If I say I was mm, hurt, perhaps, there I might use a perfect tense. But even better, in Latin I'd be more likely to use a verb for hurt. So it's not likely that we'll see these as much, but you want to be able to recognize them. So remember that that fu uh, stem is a form of sum. Now, most of you are more used to the timeline format for our verbs. So here that is. And this really helps to keep our tenses together here. So as a timeline, we put the present in the middle. The present is now, so that's our base point for our timeline. If I go backwards in time, I have the perfect, something that happened one time. And then if I go all the way back in time, I have the pluperfect. The pluperfect happened before the perfect. So I had a sandwich before I arrived at school. Had is pluperfect, arrived is perfect. I am at school now, present tense. If I go forward in time, I have the future perfect and the future. The future is pretty simple. We use that all the time. I will be there soon. The future perfect is between the present and the future. I will have seen you before I get there. We don't use that all too often, but if you want to communicate two things happening in the future at different times, it is, it's pretty vital. So I will have practiced many times before I will be able to dunk a basketball. I'm giving a time relation using those two verbs. The imperfect is one that trips people up a little bit. You notice it's not quite on the perfect timeline here. It's down underneath, but it's where it belongs. So the imperfect shows uh, action over time. So uh, for example, that I used before, I was six. I was six for an amount of time. I can use the perfect tense along with it and say, when I was six, I had the flu. One time action that happened while I was six. So the imperfect is showing a longer scale. It can also show repetition. I kept bothering my brother. 
It didn't just happen once, it happened many times over, over a period of time. Used to is another way we commonly express this in English. I used to have three best friends. Now I have more, or now I have fewer. So we can use that in any one of those ways, but notice that they all show an extended time period, as opposed to a perfect tense that is sort of a snapshot action. Something happened. A really good way to remember this is to combine them, the three tenses together and say, I had forgotten to tie my shoelace. So when I was walking down the hall, I tripped over it. I had forgotten, food perfect. So when I was walking, imperfect, I tripped, perfect. I can use them all in that one sentence. So we do use them frequently together. And this is exactly the purpose, is to differentiate between something that happened once, something that happened earlier, or something that happened for a period of time. Imperative verbs are a different mood. So they're really a whole different grab bag altogether, and it seems like it would be a big thing to learn them, but the good thing is they only have two forms. Imperative verbs are commands. We use them to give someone an order or a request. It doesn't have to be rude. These are always second person, they're always present, and they're always active voice. This is very convenient if you have to parse a verb, which means telling the, the uh, properties. If that is your task, they're very easy for imperatives. Um, they're always second person, because if I'm giving an order or making a request, I'm talking to you about something you are going to do for me. So second person. Present tense, because I'm always asking you to do it now. Um, there is such a thing as a future imperative, but we will not learn it this year. And active, because unlike in English, I cannot tell you in Latin to get wrecked or you know anything else where I'm asking you to be passive in a situation. It just doesn't make sense. So we won't use that. If I want to make a singular imperative verb, I will use just the stem, the present stem, of course, because this is a present tense verb. So present stem alone. The second principal part minus the RE. To make it plural, I'll use that same stem with TE on the end, which we pronounce TE. A good way to remember this is that uh, the words for hello and goodbye, salve and wale, are imperative verbs. Salve means be well, I'm commanding you to be healthy or asking you to be, and wale means be strong, so I'm giving you a, a request or a wish. And we add te to those as a matter of course, if we're talking to more than one person. So if I greet you all, I say salve te. And if I say goodbye to you all, I say wale te. But if I'm just greeting one of you, salve or wale. Da is my favorite example because it's so short. Just such a cute word. Da is our command for give from do, dare, dedi, datis. So I cut off the re and get da for my second principal part. To make it plural, I add te, and date would be the same thing, but addressed to more than one person. So I like to include the word y'all because it's a quick and easy way to say that I am talking to more than one. We're going to do a little practice phase here. This is our last part. I suggest that unless you're super confident about these, you work through them one at a time and pause this video as you check yourself. So take a few minutes on each one and then listen to what I tell you for the answer. Or if you need my walkthrough, I'm gonna kind of remind you how to figure this out as we go. For a ma weren't, I notice immediately that I'm using the perfect stem because there's a V and A-M-A-V is the perfect stem. So I'm in the perfect system. Then I look at the ending, erunt, that is one of the perfect endings. So I know right away that I have a perfect tense verb. I see that it is third person plural because of the ent or the erunt. I can view that as a piece or a whole there. I see that it is indicative mood because most simply it's not imperative and we haven't learned the subjunctive, so that one's pretty simple. And I do not see a passive ending on it, so it must be active voice. Knowing all those things, I would translate this verb as they loved, very simply. I could also say they did love or they have loved 
all those are perfectly fine ways to translate a perfect tense. Now you can think of those as options for yourself, or you can think of those as um, sometimes one being superior to another. So if I say, uh, they loved the dinner you cooked, that sounds pretty good. If I say, they have loved the dinner you cooked, it sounds pretty terrible. So there are some times that I would use one of these rather than another. And you, as an English speaker, can hear when one is better than another. So that's not something you have to look up or think about. It, it's just the one that sounds best to you. I'll go a little faster on the rest of these. Amabis. Second person. Singular. Future, because of the DI in the middle. Indicative and active. You will love. There's really only one way to do the future. If you want to say you're going to love, that would be fine too. But you will pretty much covers it. Amabater. I hear a passive ending in that ter. So this one is definitely passive. It's also third singular imperfect and indicative. Imperfect because of the ba. This can be he, she, or it. There's nothing about this verb that tells me it's gender. Um, verbs themselves do not have gender. That's a property of nouns and adjectives. If I had a subject with it, I might be able to specify. Or if it were passive, I might have um, that form at the beginning that tells me what is passive. If I had a, a, sorry, a perfect passive, then I would have an ending at the beginning that tells me what gender it is. But here I don't. So it's he, she, or it, any one of them is fine. Was being loved, or he was loved. Left out a D there, sorry. Sent, third person, plural, present tense, indicative and active. This is just they are. Or if it makes sense in the sentence, it might just be are. I may have a subject to go with this, like the dogs are. Fuero, also from the same word, that's also son. It's first person, singular, future perfect, indicative and active. I will have been. Eramus, still first person, but now plural. Imperfect tense, indicative and active. This is still form of son. Notice how different those three forms look. We were, we were being, or we kept being, all perfectly good options. Most of the time, imperfect of some can just be was or were, very simply. Simple is often the best. Sta. This one's a little funny. I don't see an ending. What must it be? Imperative. Second person always, singular, because it doesn't have a tail on the end. Always present tense, imperative, and always active, because I can't tell you to get stood, but I can tell you to stand. I like to include an exclamation point with uh, imperatives so that it shows I know it's a command. And fakient, I threw in here because this is something called an IO verb. Its principal parts start with fakio, it has an IO at the end, and that means sometimes we'll see an extra I. That doesn't do anything at all to the word, it's just there, it's a spelling thing. So if you see the I, don't let it bother you. If you don't see the I, you probably just spelled it wrong, and it's going to sound weird. So proceeding on with our parsing, it's third plural, present tense, indicative, and active. They make or they are making. Uh, the I's will also appear for anything fourth conjugation. If you think of words like audio and dormio, you will see those I's there. They don't change anything that's happening with the verb. It's just how it's spelled. Think of that as a spelling issue, not a grammar issue. That's all I have on verbs for you today. If you need some more review, you can go to my website at beachlatin.com or another good website resource is latintutorial.com. Both of those have videos. My website also has some practice exercises if you go to the practice tab and some games as well if you go to the games tab. But make sure it's something that helps you learn. If it doesn't help you learn, put it away and try something else. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you're watching this, and I'll see you next time.